too many people layer uh, the general language, the the stereotypical or the trending um, uh, critique or challenge and not bring it and make it relevant to where they are. Because every issue, let's just deal again with race. Every issue of race is not just black and white. I challenge my own congregation that historically was striving to be a multicultural, multi a multicultural congregation. Um, I have them understand that, you know what, when you started, the multicultural issue was black and white. But that's evolved. And the call for us in faith is greater than just black and white people get along together. OK, uh, if we're inclusive, is it inclusive across age and stage? Are we really as accepting or welcoming, not just in a, the flag bearing that we have, but can someone who is uniquely abled actually come through the door and go to the bathroom in the same side of the building? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast, where we explore how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. I'm Dwight Shiley, and I'm joined by Terry Elton. One of the key pivots we discuss frequently on this show is the pivot from one size or shape fitting all to a mixed ecology of inherited and new forms of Christian community flourishing together. Today's guest is a practitioner of the mixed ecology with deep experience helping Christian communities engage meaningfully with their neighbors. We are so excited to welcome the Reverend Dr. F. Willis Johnson to the show. Dr. Johnson is senior minister at Christ Church UMC in Columbus, Ohio, and just joined our faculty here at Luther Seminary as a visiting instructor in starting new Christian communities. He is an experienced church planner and the author of Holding Up Your Corner, Talking About Race in Your Community, which draws on his experience as a pastor in Ferguson, Missouri. Willis, welcome to the Pivot Podcast. Thank you for having me. So, Willis, I've enjoyed our conversations up to this point. We're still getting to know each other about your story and, man, all of the things that you have learned uh, from your ministry and from your background and from your experiences. You are, among other things, a ministry entrepreneur. You're also an educator, and you've started things, and you've led churches in a variety of contexts. So I wonder if you just start us off by telling a little bit about your journey, some of your touch points um, that have influenced your ministry and your understanding of really critical topics today for uh, ministry leaders. Yeah, well, thank you, and um, thank you for uh those comments, uh, <laughs> those compliments. Uh, yeah, I, I, I probably sound like somebody who can't keep a job or is not uh, very focused. Uh, but I think that uh, over the years has uh, has served well. Uh, I've, I'm actually a child, not of the parsonage, but of the classroom. Um, uh, my mother, father, grandparents uh, are educators and, and actually you know, and found myself uh, traveling down that road, at least um, in terms of a professional track at one time to be be an educator. Uh, and, I, and I get to do that. I think I'm living into that in some 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 regards. And and then I got bit by the kind of the, the political bug and and uh, had some exposure early on uh, in high school and through college where it led me uh, after graduation from college. I had an opportunity to be a gubernatorial staffer. Uh, uh, for the late Frank O'Bannon in in, um, in Indiana, uh, and served there and worked in the legislature and other kind of other things, and so um, you know that kind of work matched with um, work I was doing in kind of the municipal setting and internships that I had, uh, and then um, uh, being involved with nonprofit development uh, over the years. All those things uh, seemed to um, shape me, and then I got this this call. Uh, I knew I was doing something, uh, but it was like, I just felt like I was something else I was supposed to do. You know, life was good or life was progressing and work was, was healthy, but it just seemed like it was more for me to do. And so I was very fortunate, um, to, um, have models in ministry throughout my formation, 
uh, both as a, a young person and then as a young, per, a young aspiring ministry leader, where the leaders uh, were not just people who showed up on Sunday or hung out in the church house from Monday through Friday. They were, um, uh, you know, representatives, literally, like the city councilman who became the first black mayor was my pastor and who's now a sitting congressman and Reverend uh, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver uh, to to work under one who worked for Bill Gray, who was uh, at the time uh, the Ways and Means chair uh, and who man, but also uh, who was this young man that I became my mentor. Uh, that's what he did when he was a young adjutant or uh, aspirant uh, and being formed in ministry. And then bringing his model of ministry of someone leading a church, but still continuing to to develop uh, as a PhD candidate and who was active in community and, and who was engaged. And so I always just thought that's what, you know, that's what clergy leaders, that's what ministry leaders do, you know? Um, and then I heard this crazy notion when I was in seminary about eighth century prophets and how these were uh, individuals who most of them didn't think that they were called to a, a ministry of parish necessarily, that we would refer to, but they were people who were more in the spirit of Annie, Flew, uh, Fanny Newhamer and, and more in the, in the, in the way of, of kind of what would be working and professional or practicing people, but they had a responsibility to speak truth and to, to live out faith and to help people, uh, particularly in the ways of justice and, and, and equality and equity, I should say. Uh, and all that just shaped me. So, you know, that's, that was my, introduction into ministry. And then, you know, life kind of happened where um, some opportunities came where someone said, hey, can you take all this uniqueness and all this um, schizophrenia that uh, everyone else calls or thinks it to be? And can you bring it bare to help us create new 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 opportunities? We, we want to plant churches and we think you might have a skill set for that. And I I was fortunate enough to to get that opportunity and and um, uh, where I planted a church, uh, life seemed on uh, seemed to take root in a very unique way that that further um, heightened or stretched my trajectory as it relates to my work in ministry. So you were a pastor in Ferguson, Missouri, during a time of significant racial tension after Michael Brown was killed. Tell us a bit about that experience and how did that time shape your approach to ministry and community engagement? Well, uh, we're actually coming up on 10 years of Michael Brown in, 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 in time to come. And um, uh, I think the simplest way to state it, it was, it was hectic. <laughs> uh, it was uh, incredibly humbling. Uh, that, that, that time both of living and being, but also in ministry. And it was very formative. Um, uh, the reality that life is happening uh, sometimes doesn't always make its way uh, as much as we try in our preaching or in our in in our espousing of our faith and and and, for, and, and inviting people in faith. We think sometimes we're really like talking about what's happening, uh, but but a lot of times on the other side of our doors in our in our in our beautiful windows, there's a whole different conversation and reality that's happening. And for for my community at that time. Uh, we had no choice but to be met with what what the world what was happening in the world and the world was happening to us uh, uh, with us and the world's eyes ears and interests were upon us and it took a it took an emergent institution or or entity like the church I was planting uh, that had actually had been there for some years prior we were there probably about uh, about three and a half years before. Um, trying to do ministry and trying to be in community. And even before Michael Brown, we had two uh, so it's, uh, F uh, high level uh, uh, tornadoes that came through that community, as well as other things that had happened. And so it was already a community that was, um, that had been challenged, but we in our faith, maybe not, had not been challenged or had not, been forced to apply our faith and our witness in that way. And so um, not only was there a lot happening that made it hectic, but it was humbling because for the first time um, I had to reimagine what it meant to be um, to be a person, not only leading faith, but of faith in a space and in a, in a, in a situation that that wasn't top of mind. <laughs> that wasn't that that wasn't necessarily first response for the majority of people. Um, and 
the, the, the need for the things of church or of faith communities was not what were traditional or what we think to be traditionally what we do. Um, and we learn new. We learn to be new. We learn to be different. Uh, I learned some things about myself. Uh, I think our community learned and I relearned church. And that's the best thing that ever could have happened uh, to me, even though uh, it's good for me, but it didn't feel good to me at the time. Well, so I'm curious, what do you say you relearned how to be church? Say a little more about that. What, what did that look like for, for, this, for this new church that you were leading? Interestingly, a lot of the things that happened during our time in Ferguson, um, you know, we were aspirational that we wanted to be um, a, a community that and an expression of faith that was open. We, we literally had, uh, you know, you know, church planners, we, we, you know, we do marketing. You know, I got I got a bad video. I have to show you the video sometime. I mean, it was Emmy award winning. I mean, I got. You know, we got it. So, you know, we had this montage where we like we wanted the music to hit the streets and we wanted it to be a place that would have the door swing open and people flood in and all that stuff that was in that video. It happened, but it wasn't that it wasn't that majestic. It was like, you know, the the, the music went to the streets because the air half worked and we need to open the windows. And and then when Ferguson happened, when the when when Michael Brown and the other uh, uh, um, uh, events of that happened, um you know, the, 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 the protests and the, and, and the, the shouts from the street on Sundays were louder than the shouts and the amens, uh, in the pews. And so if you can't beat them, you got to figure out how to join them. Uh, we had to, so we, we had this idea of church that was idyllic, but we had not fully, uh, readied ourselves for what it would mean if the doors had to swing open or when the doors had to come closed to provide refuge from 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 the events of tear gas and 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 the challenge of of what it means to be um unsafe or in an, in a situation of of need we had to reimagine that church was not about sunday anymore or just sunday that most of our work and much of our our our, our benefit and and much of what we learned and were able to offer um, did not require liturgy uh, printed on a bulletin. It did not need a format. It it it, it knew no timestamp, and yet it 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 was desired, even if it was not expressed in the way or uh, asked for in the way in which we typically are asked or received in the ways best that we usually offer. And so relearning church and relearning community was like, you know what, sometimes the best thing we can do is just make ourselves available, make our space available. Um, uh, maybe uh, just be present um, uh, because that's what people ask. And how do we leverage our privilege or how in this particular case, how do we how do we do be more Pauline <laughs> uh, that we're in, that we have some some uniqueness, some citizenship, some some relationship that we can lean into on behalf of others who don't. And maybe that is more of our task than trying to baptize people with water and hand out, you know, gluten free uh, wafers. How about we be communion instead of just do communion? Yeah, I love that. There's. Two different ways uh, that I think we can go on that. I'm going to pick one of them for now and maybe leave the other to Dwight. There, uh, You've written about uh, your learnings as a leader and, and thinking specifically about race in community and the kind of transformation that we can bring with the gospel as we think differently about church. So my two questions I'll put together. Can you explain this concept that you have of um, holding up your corner and kind of the significance around community transformation, but also what is some lessons that you would give church leaders that are out there trying to faithfully navigate the racial issues that they might be facing in their own community as you think about, um, as you reflect on some of those learnings from that time? Well, I, one, the, the concept of holding up your corner, I wish it was original. You know, I'm a creature of, of the, of the canon of, and, and so, um, you know, there's this, there's this cool gospel narrative around these brothers who, who, um, have a hurt friend and they don't like the fact that their friend has been hurt or is suffering or hurting. And so they, they, they come together and say, Hey, let's take the hurt one to the source of help and hope. 
And so this that actual narrative, uh, I think, in its in, in, in its original form, uh, translates out to something to the effect that each of them grabbed uh, a piece or a corner of what was the pallet or the mat or the, the bedding that 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 their their friend was laying on. And they each took a piece of that and made their way to the source of help and hope. And uh, as I like to say, they got there. It was crowded. So they uh, they they decided to tear the roof off the sucker in the words of uh, my great theologian, um, uh, George Clinton. And um, and they lowered them down. And of course, you know, these things, because this is a scholarly, uh, a scholarly group that's listening here, I'm sure. And they already know that the, the story goes that uh, when the 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 source of help and hope saw their faith, then their friend, their brother was healed. And so holding up your corner is really just me, you know, taking taking my imagination and also believing what we all can do. We can't fix all of the problem. All of the problem is not ours to fix. Um, but there's a piece of something that we can do and that we can we can activate that may be part of a greater exercise or a collective work. And 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 that's what holding up your corner means. And, and I, I really say that particularly because, you know, we hear expressions like in my little corner of the world or on my corner. You know what? Yes. So many people. And I and I know this is probably uh, I'm teetering into dangerous territory because I know you're a missiologist uh, uh, or two around, around on this broadcast. I have no problem with mission. Matter of fact, we should all be on mission. We should all be on purpose. Um, everyone's call to mission is not necessarily across waters and across uh, great, great means of travel. Some of us just need to cross the street. Some of us just need to uncross our arms and our eyes uh, and and look before us and right at us. And so that that kind of metaphor and theme, uh, one, you know, it, it took when I spoke about it. People liked it. It worked uh, Two, you know, the publisher thought that was cool, easy to work with. But more importantly, it's it um, I think it's indicative even now more than ever that um, we not try to find the biggest issue, problem, or the, the most complicated thing to solve. Let's just find something to grab hold on. There's power in that. And, and that's more accessible for most of us. And start where we are and then venture out um, is, is where that comes from. To, to the question about, or the point about what, what would I encourage um, leaders to do how to begin to navigate or negotiate, uh, particularly issues of, of, of race. Um, I'm always sensitive uh, because uh, if you read the book, while it, it highlights um, probably this nation's greatest and most uh, pervasive uh, sin and struggle, which is our issue of othering, of race and, and of, of, uh, of, in, of, of respectful in, uh, disrespectful intolerance of each other, um, it is... The ideas transcend. They they speak to whatever issues that divide, um, that dehumanize, that demean. And so I always encourage people just like finding something small or a piece of something to do uh, that they would invite themselves. uh, That they would first start with what is nearest to them and what's most before them. And that's that person in the mirror. Um, to start to begin to look at yourself. Um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi talks about we must become the change we wish to see. Uh, so many um, so many people look outward and don't look inward. And so for clergy leaders particularly, uh, for community leaders in faith, and I'm a, please forgive me, but I want to go here possibly for some in the audience. I, I say this to students a lot. People always say, well, how do I talk about race um, in my community? And I kind of look at them and I'm like, OK, well, I'm not trying to make a lot of assumptions, but how many people that look like me are in your community? OK, what is what is the what does race look like or what does the issue look like in your community? Because I think if you're preaching contextually or if you're leading with uh, with through a lens of of your your mission field or of your your constituency, your audience, your um, then that in itself should help inform uh, and uh, encourage uh, and invite you to figure or discern what you, you speak on. So I'm always interested when students kind of ask me this. 
the first thing I say is this. Um, acknowledge whatever is not right in your space or community. If it happens to be uh, issues of race and, and ethnic and cultural uh, uh, dissidence and intolerance and, and incompetence, okay, what, what about it is wrong? Um, too many people layer uh, the general language, the, the stereotypical or the trending um, uh, critique or challenge and not bring it and make it relevant to where they are. Because every issue, let's just deal again with race. Every issue of race is not just black and white. I challenge my own congregation that historically was striving to be a multicultural, multi, uh, multicultural congregation. Um, I have them understand that, you know what, when you started, the multicultural issue was black and white. But that's evolved. And the call for us in faith is greater than just black and white people get along together. OK, uh, if we're inclusive, is it inclusive across age and stage? Are we really as accepting or welcoming, not just in a, the flag bearing that we have, but can someone who is uniquely abled actually come through the door and go to the bathroom in the same side of the building? Well, you have to acknowledge that, which means you have to look at yourself and you have to look at your space and you have to look at where you're at versus going all the way down the street around the corner or to D.C., and judging and critiquing about something that is not immediate or relevant. So we acknowledge, and then the last two, we work through how it is and what it is that we understand and how others other understand what it is that's not right and how we make it right or what would be um, uh, both respectful or right and even righteous for the space or the co the co uh, co cooperative space that we share and existence that we have. And then we make we make decision to actually um, uh, do something different or act. That if we see something that's not right, we believe it not right, then we should not just keep letting it be wrong. <laughs> when you know better, you do better. You know? And so uh, that's a thumbnail sketch of, of not just what I learned in my own struggles and strivings, but it's what I invite. And I'm still having to do it because the issues are ever evolving. Race is one, um, but however we other or whatever is different than ourselves uh, or our communities that we may not understand or that we may not um, be, be as loving and just towards, it's not the other people. It's like, it starts with me and we. You know, I love the way that you're inviting us into concrete actions that are local as a place to begin. You know, I think so often it's easy to get very abstract or very grandiose <laughs> when we think about things like, you know, prophetic witness and, um, but change happens really, you know, grounded in the local. And so this is, a, I think, a really encouraging message. Um, so one of the things that we're curious to wonder with you about is, you know, a lot of the church leaders we work with have expectations on them from their communities that they're really supposed to just kind of fix the existing inherited form of church, right? And fix whatever the problems are with it, bring it back to some previous historical moment where it seemed to be working better. Um, usually 19-something, <laughs> nine, sorry. Usually 50, 75 years ago, something <laughs> like that. Um, rather than leaning into uh, helping a community discern and follow God's leading. And in our previous conversations, we've heard you talk about discerning God's leading. And so share a bit with our listeners and viewers, um, how can churches lean into that work of discerning God's leading? What does that look like? And I'm curious how it relates to what you've been just sharing about the concrete local actions. I'm glad you asked that because I'm really uh, both uh, personally struggling or wrestling with this in, in a lot of ways. And um, I guess trying to write and, and practice through it literally in this moment. I, th I think we, um, you know, first of all, trying to do anything different is hard. 
trying to learn something. Can we say amen to that? I think that would be a good amen. (laughs) I pastor, I pastor and parent across generations. So I have some kids who are really already potty trained and old and, and, uh, and then I got this youngest one who is not, and, uh, and it's hard. It's hard. It's messy. It's, it's, it get, you know, anyway. So yeah, it's hard. So again, acknowledge change is hard and, and, but it's, it's, it's necessary as it, as it relates to maturing and becoming. I would ask people to do as I'm trying to do now. Um, one, not to approach or involve yourself in this exercise out of desperation. Too many faith communities are forced or find themselves in these conversations way too late or under under protest and pretense that does not uh, allow for the full emotion, the full expression of what I'm about to offer up, which is to dare to be curious. Um, when I said I talked about unlearning church, I had to get past the fear of um, if I don't do th- if I do this differently, who will be mad? What will be affected? So a, a good example, um, the struggle to um, find yourself offering something other than Sunday. OK, you and I, you, you all know that. Um, Despite whatever we may think and however faith, however faithful people are, Sunday in um, in American culture is no longer the Lord's day alone. Okay, um, there's a three letter word or acronym that's not G O D that Sunday is commandeered by. So I tell people right off the bat, hey, I'll have you home for kickoff. Come to my church. I'm gonna have you home for kickoff. I live in the middle of Big Ten country. Uh, so I think we share that reality. I also live in the middle of, of major uh, sports uh, teams, and so I have found myself being curious on what what has people attracted to what they are attracted to. Where is it that people are finding the things that I believe um, my tradition or my my expression, my community? offers to people, why is it that they see it or may experience it differently or more aptly elsewhere? And so being a church planner, I spent more time going to coffee shops and boot camps and gyms. Uh, I joined uh, running clubs and uh, I had a bike team uh, that I learned how to cycle a hundred, you know, do century, century rides. Uh, and, you know, and I said, Oh, I know why this is cool. Cause one, you know, it meets me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a former collegiate athlete. I'm a, I'm a weekend warrior and this is my jam. But then these people checked up on me or they invited my family and they didn't just ride bikes. They went and had better potlucks. Matter of fact, they didn't have a potluck. They had, they had a keg. <laughs> They had they had the they had the brew of the holy. I mean, Luther would be proud of them. Uh, yes. <laughs> how else do you fund? How else do you fund the ministry and sustain your health? Talk to Peter, Timothy. Come here. Take some for your stomach. So anyway, all that to say, if you missed it in listening, be curious. Curiosity. Curiosity. I think right now is where I stand. I'm curious to know. The good and the bad. I'm curious to know the other side. In my conversations and in my engagement, I have some TV stations that I have to pray and prepare myself, but I give myself a time limit and I watch them and I listen. And it sometimes it hurts, but I need to know what's being said or what's happening. I I just recently uh, closed my church on Sunday, this past Sunday. We did not have worship at our campus. I sent my congregation and leaders to go visit other churches and worship with them and to experience what they do. Because I think, one, I have people who have not left that church since. 
Now, that's a dangerous proposition. Trust me, I got a phone call from my finance team. Okay? Okay? How are we supposed to take offering? Uh, uh, how do you use take off? I mean, people gonna give, they gonna give. Curiosity is, I think, in right now, that's what is in my spirit. That is what I'm inviting people, and that's even what I'm mining for in me. The more curious I am with questions, the more the more curious I am to to explore and to experiment. I'm hoping that that will catch on. And I'm hoping that that will become the, the culture and or at least um, uh, a practice or, or a means for for others, because I believe for discipleship formation, that it is in the curiosity that disciples are made. Last time I checked, um, the 12 came nosy. You know, a couple of them came because they trusted Jesus, but uh, a few of them were plus one or two and they just came to see what's happening. They were curious, and then they got stuck. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to the elves. I love that, and I think as a whole, we're maybe not as curious as we could be outside of the church, say nothing about inside of the church, and I think that's that's very well said, and it changes more than what are we going to do with their offering or we're going to tweak worship? It suddenly is how I see people, right? That curiosity gets contagious and um, kind of becomes a mindset, right? Of our, to the world. So I want to, I want to kind of take this one step further and some would say, well, Willis, why do we need more churches? We got plenty. Haven't you seen all the empty buildings or whatever? And I think um, some might say, can we just re refresh the churches we have? I'd love to hear you talk about why is it important to plant churches, to begin anew, to think differently from the very beginning? Uh, why do we need that in our, in our church ecology right now? Strangely enough, um, I don't know if you guys have heard this or not. Everybody ain't saved. <laughs> Is this a secret? <laughs> yeah. Don't tell Everybody ain't saved. Um, in the most technically advanced uh, period of, of, of our human existence, we are experiencing the greatest level of biblical illiteracy than we've ever experienced probably prior to the printing press. And now you can get a Bible, you know, anywhere at on demand. Now it's not just about um, trying to save people per se, but um, I share it, I share it that way because um, I live again, I, 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 I emanate from Columbus, Ohio, and we've got, um, uh, we've got, uh, I don't know if you know Columbus, Ohio is kind of the um, test market of restaurants. It's a community. It's a it's a it's a town that test markets a lot of stuff. And we've got this entrepreneur, this restaurant tour uh, by the name. I, I should get some hookup. Hopefully uh, this will give me some uh, some uh, shout out, some uh, some shout out, some pub and maybe put me in the front of the line at Butcher and Rose. Uh, Brother Mitchell, Cameron Mitchell, your new your new steakhouse. Uh, Want to be on the side for the uh Anyway, so Cameron Mitchell is this this uh, phenomenal restaurateur, has a number of restaurants, particularly in Columbus and Florida and other places. And um, since I've been here, I don't know how many restaurants he's opened. He's got more than 100 restaurants. He keeps opening these restaurants. I have nobody ever says, why does Cameron Mitchell keep opening up restaurants? Matter of fact, they're building a McDonald's, a new McDonald's. I haven't seen a new McDonald's brick and mortar in years. Like, I didn't even know they still were building McDonald's. They already sold a billion, but I guess they ain't sold a zillion because you can't never sell a good thing enough. Or in the case of Cameron Mitchell and his restaurants, I believe um, there is such an expansiveness around uh, the marketplace or audience for how people want to engage or experience the culinary options that he has. And he cooks everything from you know, steaks to Mexican food to to Italian food to whatever, and he gives it at every level. 
You want it at a four star, want to want to be Michelin level? He's got it. If you want to just be a family pub, you can go down here to the rusty bucket and get you some fish and chips and some and a good brew on that Sunday after church before kickoff. He's got it. I think we have to have that same mentality that there's still more to do. There are many people who have not been met by or their areas of of location or experience uh, or their staging and their aesthetic or their palette uh, demands, desires something more uh, specific to them. And so if we can, why not? Why not make it comfortable or why not make it uh, extravagant or or high church or or friendly and and low touch? Why not make it accessible quick and drive through uh, or somewhere where you can come and be very uh, uh, can be very monastic and 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 contained, (laughs) whatever the case may be? I think there the marketplace and the market experience is never is is not yet satiated nor saturated. And so I don't think we need to be fearful about about um, about church because people in business aren't fearful about starting something new that's already out there. I mean, uh, but I also believe because. um, If you understand it this way, if you only see church from building, if you only see church with in an organized or cons- in, a, in a very uh, uh, linear or limited way, then, yeah, you probably say we don't need any more buildings. We don't need any more things that do this or that. But each of us have. Uh, I may be struggling here or challenging someone's theology here a little bit, but more and more, we're all little churches. I mean, we and and I want to be careful when I say this, though, but the profession of faith or the profession of upon this rock, I build a church was not a groundbreaking and a ribbon cutting. It was not an excavating of 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 somewhere and laying out and mapping out a physical space. It was more than that, that also invites us to be emblematic of that Um, the same way that we have. We have scripture and, and understanding that that tells us that we are we are the embodiment or the enfleshment of the holy, that they, we are vessels that are uh, temperate, temple like. OK, if you look in from it from that perspective, then you start saying, OK, so what is it? That could become something that I could not so much build up and own and, and control, but where where am I or what expression do I have of faith that I could share and invite others to be a part of if appropriate? But at the same time, I can also be my expression of faith. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't know. I just I I'm a little bit more imaginative and maybe crazy and expansive than most people. But I, I love the connection to the restaurants. And I, we have a colleague, Scott Carmode, who talks about in, in innovation the sense of what does it mean to listen for the longings and losses of people's lives and to be messengers of the gospel, to tend to those hurts, to, to um, accompany them through those times, to, to bring good news of the gospel. And, and I think our communities are dynamic and the longings and losses of people change and how are we listening and being curious to what what that is and so for me i was wrapping those things that you had said together as as i was thinking about the work he's invited our uh students here at luther into that are take our innovation class and other things that we have used to help us think as we look forward into what does it mean to witness to this beautiful story of the gospel in this time and in this place with these challenges and these opportunities, right? That's Thurman S. That sounds like the genuine. <laughs> What's authentic to you? That's why I guess that's why Cameron says authentically Italian, because them other places are not. So I need my <laughs> other places. 
Well, I think you are inviting uh, churches to be clear about what their story is and then to be curious as to how they can connect with their neighbors because, you know, we need more churches because so many churches are disconnected from neighbors. And that's actually the wonderful opportunity. And um, aren't curious. And and, and sadly, aren't curious. They may be distracted. Um, They may have other things going on, but they're not curious. Yeah. Well, Willis, I want to thank you for being with us today. I feel like there's two or three more episodes we could create, and maybe we'll look down the road to do that, to share more of your insights and wisdom. Um, You have a website, and let me see if I got it right, fwillisjohnson.info. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that still works. All right. So (laughs) um, you can go find your books that you've written, some more about you at that. We also... For those of our listeners uh, that are going to be connected to Luther Seminary, you're going to have some more input to our students here and some work that you're specifically doing around cultivating new Christian communities. So that's exciting for those of us that will be hanging around St. Paul a bit. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited about it. Well, and thank you also to our audience for joining us on this episode of Pivot. To help spread the word about Pivot, please like and subscribe if you're catching us on YouTube, or if you're listening, head to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. It really helps. Finally, the best compliment you can give us is to share this Pivot podcast with a friend. Maybe something Willis said in this uh, resonates with you and you want to share that. So please feel free to do that. So until next time, this is Terry Elton and Dwight Shiley signing off from another episode of the Pivot Podcast. We'll see you next week.